As the golden years of the 1920s drew to a close, the people of the United States had no cause to fear the future. But what seemed to be a thriving society on the surface was plagued underneath by uneven economic growth. Class, location, and race were all factors in this. The drastic differences in socioeconomic status became glaringly apparent when the stock market crashed on Monday, October 28, 1929. As the prices plummeted, millions of dollars were lost. The ripple effect of the crash from both businesses and individuals would affect everyone in the country, as well as around the globe. By 1932, it was estimated that 28% of households contained only one wage earner, and half of the city's property taxes went unpaid. In Milwaukee County, the number of wage earners had dropped from 117,000 in 1929 to 66,000 in 1932. The urban workforce was hit the hardest by wage cuts and layoffs. Individuals and families who could not afford a place to live were often displaced into shanty towns called Hoovervilles, scathingly named after President Hoover. Milwaukee's Hooverville was located in Estabrook Park along the Milwaukee River. President Hoover and his government did not do much to help those most affected by the crash, believing that the economy would soon right itself. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, elected in 1932, had different ideas. He immediately put the Emergency Banking Act through Congress, creating a mandatory bank holiday requiring all banks to close and undergo a federal inspection. By ensuring the soundness of the banks, faith in the banking system increased. And Roosevelt didn't stop there. He created numerous federal agencies and administrations to stimulate economic growth and to care for those in need. We still have the Social Security Act of 1935 as the most visible legacy of this time. The American Association of University Women, already firmly established, had 37,000 members nationwide by the beginning of the 30s. Wisconsin had 2,150 of those members. The Milwaukee branch of the AAUW began devoting time to social service activities such as sewing and knitting for the Red Cross and St. Vincent de Paul Society. About 125 members participated in these efforts regularly. Still more women dedicated many hours to enlisting their fellow club members to aid in the National Recovery Administration and the Works Project Administration. Milwaukee was home to many projects funded through the government's new programs. A primary source of providing work was through the building and renovation of public parks with a pay rate of 70 cents an hour. Brown Deer Park, Estabrook Park, and Lincoln Park are only a few that benefited from the programs. Lincoln Memorial Drive was also completely repaved during this time, and the Milwaukee Public Library and Museum were painted with murals. The Milwaukee Handicraft Project was another enterprise funded through the Works Projects Administration. It operated between 1935 and 1941, employing over 5,000 women and minorities in the Milwaukee area. The project was headed by Harriet Clinton and Elsa Ulbricht, who stated that the goal was to make by hand household articles of wood, paper, yarn, and cloth. The objects made will be distributed to relief families, nursery schools serving relief families, and publicly owned institutions. Objects made included braided rugs, scrapbooks for hospital waiting rooms, and toys. The project hired women of all nationalities and ages who were generally uneducated and unskilled, creating a highly integrated workforce. Milwaukee's mayor during these years of the Great Depression was Daniel Holm, a socialist from Waukesha. Due to his efforts to ensure Milwaukee operated on a cash basis rather than credit, the city was able to avoid some of the banking and financial fiascos other cities faced. This has occasionally been referred to as the Milwaukee Miracle. In order to keep the city financially sound, Holm advocated for scrip, a kind of pseudo-currency that would be distributed locally until real money could be found. The law, however, was struck down in the city council until it allowed for a 5% interest rate on the script itself. Under Hohn, Milwaukee enjoyed a reputation as a crime-free city and won the United States Interchamber Health Conservation Contest in both 1930 and 1932. The city was barred from competition in 34 and 35 to level the playing field. Despite the economic hardship, people still found ways to have fun. Most popular were inexpensive types of recreation, such as dancing. Mini-golf was developed as a less expensive version of regular golf. Sports such as football and baseball served as welcome distractions. 
Movies also provided an excellent form of escapism, and so the economic downturn did not drastically affect movie attendance. Chess also became more popular among school children in Milwaukee, who were taught on playgrounds. In 1939, a citywide junior chess tournament was held at Marquette University Stadium. The radio gained popularity as a form of entertainment during the 30s. Airtime began to include weather reports, recorded music, and talk shows. Roosevelt took advantage of the growing audience base by beginning his fireside chats in 1933. The reach of the radio was so widespread that when The War of the Worlds, a fictional story about aliens coming to Earth, was presented on the air as a series of eyewitness reports interrupting an orchestra concert, the contrived realism created a widespread panic among audience members. The atmosphere at the end of the 1930s was drastically different than what it had been only a decade before. Instead of viewing the future openly and optimistically, the people were more cautious with their savings and their decisions. Having to buckle down for years meant that families were more isolated, eroding the sense of community that had flourished immediately after the Great War. The intense focus on fixing internal problems caused the people to remain mostly concerned with the situation at home, although they viewed the growing armies of Germany, Japan, and Italy with apprehension. What they did not know was that the war brewing in Europe was, yet again, going to come to them.